uh, essential impulses of, of what film meant or could mean, both the documentary impulse and the fantasy subjective or cultural impulse. And as I was thinking about that after the talk yesterday, I suddenly remembered or half remembered a passage from Krakauer's uh, Theory of Film, uh, a, a very powerful book for its period from the 1960s. Uh, and that's a, a book which really emphasizes the realist elements of film, its capacity to document and represent the real. And actually, Krakauer doesn't really like films which aren't realistic. He's kind of against the fantasy, fictive, surreal elements. Nonetheless, he has a sort of problem with Hitchcock because he both admires Hitchcock, but he, he finds it difficult to understand why he likes him when Hitchcock's films are fictions and not documentaries in a sense. Here, first of all, is a statement of that extreme realist emphasis on the utility of cinema from the introduction of Krakauer's book. Film, he writes, is essentially an extension of photography and therefore shares with this medium a marked affinity for the visible world around us. Films come into their own when they record and reveal physical reality. Films are true to the medium to the extent they penetrate the world before our eyes. What I'm suggesting to you here is that uh, a kind of limitation of Krakauer's view, if you take it through logically, is that for him, in a sense, films only work when they're documentaries, when they, quote, record and reveal physical reality. In this sense, he says, films can only cling to the surface of things. And he quotes from the French poet Paul Valéry, the cinema diverts the spectator from the core of his being. And with that quotation from Valéry, you have that anti-cinema emphasis that we saw in Levis, the difficulty of dealing with cinema as an art. Film can only cling to the surface of things. Its danger is that it diverts the spectator from the core of his being. That's what fiction film can do. But then Krakauer gets in a bit of trouble because, like virtually everybody else, he finds he really likes Hitchcock. And so he tries to explain how that can be the case, given the the boundaries and limits of his emphasis on realism in cinema. And this is how he puts it. And I, you know, I quote this, and this is why I remembered it as I was thinking about today's lecture yesterday, as it seems to describe what the drama of Rear Window is uh, without realizing it's doing that. On Hitchcock, he writes, nobody is so completely at home in the dim border region where inner and outer events intermingle and fuse with each other. And that's the kind of frame for uh, my examination or introduction of this film, Rear Window, as a film that exemplifies what Krakauer uh, says is a general tendency in Hitchcock, but is one in which perhaps Rear Window is the exemplary uh, statement of that. A film which occupies a border region where inner and outer events intermingle and fuse with each other. The outer events which Jeffries and the camera sees, the inner events of how these are interpreted by Jeffries and uh, by the spectators of the film themselves. And in that emphasis on the interpretation of external events, um, I thought, you know, I'd also recollected 
the famous uh, duck rabbit uh, experiment, which was picked up by the philosopher uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. And if you look at the uh, image on the left, I'd like to ask you, although, you know, we're not in that lecture where we can go backwards and forwards so easily, so I'll just have to ask you in an imaginary way or for you to take note of, what do you see when you see that image on the left? Well, some people will likely see it as a duck with its mouth and lips uh, on the right of the image, while others will see it as a rabbit with the ears of the rabbit being on the right. Now, what's so striking here, um, this is a little ex experiment that I want you to engage in, is that, you know, as I say, this is a duck, you're very likely to be able to read the image as a duck. But when I say it's a rabbit, you're very likely to read the image as being that of a rabbit. And even as you, as you look at it, you can alternate in your mind between interpreting the image as a duck or as a rabbit. But of course, you can never see it as both a duck and a rabbit at the same instant of time. To apprehend the image and to process it, you have to give it a name. And this is why Wittgenstein was very interested in this little puzzle from Gestalt psychology, as it introduced a whole theory of what it meant to put things into words, to grasp things through words. It meant what he called, it brought into operation what he called seeing as something very specific to aesthetics in his theory. Uh, seeing as, which means grasping through description and through putting things into words. And I think here he's echoing the um, connotations of the core German term for the concept, das Begriff, which, you know, ironically enough for an abstract concept of concept is a very physical world, word, das Begriff, a, a taking hold of or a grasping, uh, a wonderful phrase for an intellectual process, stressing its physicality. And I mentioned that because Rear Window is above all a drama of seeing as, as seeing something, running it through a description, and then that description tending to cancel out other ways of, of understanding what you've seen. That perhaps is the drama of, of Rear Window. And I'm presuming you've all seen the film uh, or we'll see it after the lecture. Unfortunately, as I said before, we can't make it available to you. Um, but I'm hoping you'll get hold of it somehow. Uh, Rear Window is a story of a photographer who is laid up in bed in his tiny flat in Greenwich Village uh, because he's broken his leg while photographing a racing car. He's a kind of action photographer. And somehow he's got involved with uh, a beautiful young woman, a socialite involved in the fashion industry, and they've fallen in love. But as we'll see, there are some problems with that. Jeffries spends his days and increasingly part of his nights observing the neighbours in the very large courtyard-like structure 
uh, created by the different blocks of flats in his area. New York, you know, as you know, a very densely packed uh, city landscape. And he sees all kinds of things going on. He sees who he refers to as Miss Torso, uh, a dancer constantly pra practicing her dance moves in her specially designed underwear. He sees a composer trying to compose a tune on his piano and getting very frustrated. He sees the everyday life of those around him, another married couple constantly having to lower uh, their dog into a garden uh, from their upper story flat. Uh, he sees a newlywed couple. And above all, he sees an intriguing uh, set of events occur with a married couple across the way where Jeffries hypothesizes from what he sees that the wife has been murdered. In this film, Jeffries, with his binoculars and ultimately uh, a large lens camera, observes his neighbours. He becomes himself a spectator. And the film in this sense, actually relates to what I described yesterday with The Lodger as part of that drive for cinema to do what it does best, in Grierson's words, to get around the world, to see everything. Uh, it performs the idea of being able to see many different aspects and dimensions of society and represent them in the film. In fact, we might say that um, what Hitchcock does in Rear Window is to fulfill something that he'd uh, mentioned to Truffaut in that series of interviews, the symphony of the city, the cinema as the representation of the city uh, that he desired to do. He said to Truffaut, I'd like to do 24 hours in the life of a city and I can see the whole picture from beginning to end. It's full of incidents, full of backgrounds, a complete cyclic movement. Look at everything, film everything and show all of that. And in a sense, that is rear window. It moves in a cyclical movement. It begins in the morning moves through to evening. The next big sequence begins in the morning, moves through to evening. You know, it follows everyday life in its sampling of, of, of different lives, different families, different people that he can see from the room of his tiny, cramped, hot, sweaty apartment. In this presentation, Jeffries, the photographer and spectator, comes to resemble, says one critic, Dana Brand, uh, a figure from the history of culture known as the flaneur, um, someone who wanders around the city enjoying watching the crowds and uh, is written about especially in Edgar Allan Poe's little short story, The Man in the Crowd. As Brand puts it, uh, as Poe does in The Man of the Crowd, in Rear Window, Hitchcock undermines, undermines the Flaner's confident paternalistic sense of power over his field of vision. In other words, what is subjected to scrutiny and suspicion is whether Jeffries is interpreting what he sees in the correct sort of way. And in fact, there are other echoes of Poe's work in Rear Window, and Hitchcock uh, did note that he had read Edgar Allan Poe and was interested in him and re regarded him as a remarkable artist of suspense. Uh, in the story, a man obsessively follows an old man he glimpsed in the crowd, convinces himself that he is a murderer, 
but finally, after following the old man around for many days, is unable to find any evidence of this and ends up displaying his own obsessiveness by saying simply that even if he couldn't find any evidence, it only proves what a cunning crook and murderer the guy was. Those are, I think that forms a very interesting, what critics call an intertext, uh, a, re a text that's referred to in, in one story uh, and plays with it in some way. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to hold onto as we think about Rear Window, the drama of the spectator and his or her interpretation whether he's seeing whether seeing it as one thing is really um, supported by the evidence. Hitchcock also spoke more directly to Truffaut about Rear Window uh, when Truffaut asked him, I imagine the story appealed to you because it represented a technical challenge, a whole film from a viewpoint of one man. And Hitchcock Hock agreed. Absolutely. It was a possibility of doing a purely cinematic film. You have an immobilized man looking out. That's one part of the film. The second part shows what he sees. And the third part shows how he reacts. This is actually the purest expression of a cinematic idea. In other words, as we've mentioned in previous lectures, the whole structure of Rear Window is, in a sense, structured around the idea of montage. You show one thing, you show another, a conclusion is drawn from that which makes you see the third image in a different way. And Hitchcock refers directly to this tradition of Eisenstein and Vertov, but also Pudovkin and Kuleshov all at that first film school in the world, the Russian Film Institute, founded in 1919. Podovkin dealt with this. He describes an experiment by his teacher Kuleshov in the, uh, in the film school. You see a close-up of the actor Ivan Muzhukin, and we looked at that the other day. You see his face, the bowl of soup, the face again, the spectator reads that film because of the montage and the association as one of hunger with the child in the coffin of sadness, of the languorous woman with desire. In fact, the face stays the same, but the spectator interprets the face differently, seeing it as having those expressions through the force of the montage. Hitchcock puts it this way in relation to Rear Window, extending his analogy. Let's take a close-up of Stuart looking out the window at a little dog. Back to Stuart, who has a kindly smile. But if in the place of a little dog, you show a half-naked girl exercising in front of an open window, and you go back to a smiling Stuart, this time he's seen as a dirty old man. Sure, says Truffaut, he's a snooper, but aren't we all? And Truffaut adds, and James Stewart is exactly in the position of a spectator looking at a movie. In other words, what I think is quite interesting here is that uh, following the analogy of Jeffrey's in rear window, becoming like a cinematic spectator, what's at stake throughout is how he's interpreting what he sees, what his relation to what he sees actually is. Further discussing Rear Window, Truffaut notes, when he first saw the film and wrote about it in Cahiers du Cinema in 1958, he remembers writing that the picture was a very gloomy, rather pessimistic and quite evil. But now I don't see it in that light at all. In fact, I feel it has a rather compassionate approach. And again, just noting Truffaut's different views, 
that also brings to the fore the importance of interpretation and how you can interpret things differently, duck, rabbit, according to what sort of questions you're asking, what sort of framework you are bringing to what you see. And Hitchcock actually describes the film's montage effect slightly differently in another uh, conversation. Here he says, Rear Window was a satisfactory experience because it was the epitome of the subjective experience of seeing and interpreting things. A man looks, he sees, he reacts to a woman even more than to a situation. Thus, you construct a mental process. Rear Window is entirely a mental process done visually. And I've just... Uh, italicized that phrase, a man looks, he sees, he reacts to a woman even more than to a situation, because this displaces or shifts the center of gravity of the film. In uh, most readings of the film, they dwell on the level of plot, at the murder that Jeffrey sees as being the crucial kind of... Uh, narrative point of the film. But another way of seeing the film is not to see it as uh, centered on the murder, but rather as centered on the subjective experience that goes on between Jeffries and the woman he's in love with and who's certainly in love with him, but he can't bring himself to attach to fully, to marry and so on. So in one construction of the story, the murder is at the center. In another, the question of marriage and love is at the center. Or in another kind of interpretive schema, it's having both those centers and seeing how they interact, which makes the film such an extraordinarily captivating and interesting experience. And then I just wanted to recall before we go into the film uh, a little bit more in detail to refer to another detail which goes back to the question of how film realizes fantasy and to note Hitchcock's obsessive concern with how to dress Grace Kelly in the, in the movie. Edith Head the costumer for the film, you know, had long discussions with Hitchcock about this and, you know, show the ways in which film is collaborative, but in which the director can also have a very powerful influence over everything. Every costume was detailed in the finished script for the film. There was a reason for every colour Grace wore, every style, and Hitchcock was absolutely certain about everything. For one scene, he saw her in pale green. For another, in white chiffon. He was really putting his dream together in the studio. And that suggests another uh, dimension to the film and how to read it, how to understand it. Seeing Hitchcock's fantasy inscribed in the film. But then, as we try and read that fantasy, are we in the position of Jeffries trying to read what's happening to his neighbours? The film is a kind of maze of mirrors in which the question of seeing, the question of interpretation, is constantly probed and raised, undermined, strengthened. That's what makes it such a fascinating kind of film. And... For those of you who have access to um, the film, you, are, you know, these slides will be made available to you later. You might in particular like to watch the following sequences, which uh, I'll use to develop some of the things I've suggested here. What I'm calling the peeping Tom sequence at around eight to nine minutes into the film, the trouble sequence, the kiss sequence, the distractions 
I mean, you can look at those later. We're not going to have time to even look at all of those. But um, let's try and look at uh, and look at one of them if we can. Uh, and here's the first one where this is right at the beginning of the film and you're given Jeffrey's waking up and looking at his neighbors through the window and he's obviously very curious he, he's paid particular attention to the <clears throat> to the to the dancing model uh, with whom he refers to as Miss Torso and then he's interrupted in his reverie by the arrival of his nurse Let's just see what happens there. Jeffries is still watching his papers here. New York State sentence for keeping Tom is six months in the workhouse. The penalty for a peeping Tom is six months in the workhouse, says his nurse who enters his apartment and disturbs his rather voyeuristic viewing. Here you have right at the beginning of the film, not just the idea of Jeffries as a spectator of what's going on around him, just as we are spectators watching him, but of the question of the perversity of watching, the curiosity of watching, the curiosity that a figure such as Freud said was always intensely sexual in nature, a peeping Tom. They got no windows in the workhouse. You know, in the old days, they used to put your eyes out with a red hot poker. Any of those bikini bombshells you're always watching were the red hot poker? Oh, dear. We become a race of peeping toms. And as she comes forward into the foreground of the frame, you'll see, she says, we've become a nation of peeping toms. Now here, for uh, a number of critics, you have the entry of another dimension of the film's meanings. And remember, the more dimensions of meaning there are at work in a text, the more literally complex rather than simple it becomes as one layer is added to another the more open to complex interpretation it comes. And when we think that this film is produced in an America which was a little foreign to Hitchcock as a British guy, uh, we might also remember that at this point in its history, America was being, pre-Homeland Security, was being encouraged to become a nation of peeping toms as the surveillance mechanisms of McCarthyism had been fully in operation for a while. And a new definition of a security state, watch your neighbors for odd behavior, was fully in force. And no spectator in the US cinema at the time of uh, the release of the film would have been unlikely to see some of the significance of that emphasis on watching your neighbours. Uh, just, just to mention that. Uh, let's move on a little to another sequence of the film. And here, I also, as I said before, just wanted to share with you some of the uh, ways in which film is actually studied as an academic discipline. As I said, we all have memories of film, uh, but film is fast, 24 frames a second. When it comes to scientifically or academically analyzing and interpreting film, you have to do a very careful and very laborious job of actually trying to get hold of the moving image. And this can be done through making 
a rough and ready transcript in which you get a piece of paper divided into three columns, one marked moving image, second marked recorded phonetic sound or dialogue, the third, well, all the other signifying elements, music, sound, and actually lighting, clothing, you know, many, many other things as well. In the sequence we're about to see, which is, you know, less than a minute long actually, but is really important. And you can only, your memory of it might be that it's important because your memory has been prompted to get hold of it in a certain way. But as a film analyst, it's really important to, to, to actually grasp how it is that the film is making you grasp it. And this, in this little sequence, is through uh, the use of, of close-up or medium close-up. In your memory, you might not remember this, but if you analyze it, it's absolutely clear where Hitchcock is placing the emphasis for the viewer to follow. We'll, we'll watch this in a moment, but just let's run through the complex. This is just after the nurse has come in. They've had a little bit more conversation and they're continuing their conversation. Jeffrey says, I think you're right. She's been saying you'll get in trouble for being a peeping Tom. Jeffrey says, I think you're right. There is going to be trouble around here. Stella, the nurse, says, I knew it. And then you have, as I say, what's easy to miss in memory, but is very vivid when you actually analyse it. In the next shot, shot, you shift to more or less the first medium close-up in this sequence of the film. And that shift from a medium shot where there are two people in, in, in view to a medium close-up in which, although Stella is there, but you only see a bit of her, to a more closer attention to Jeffrey's face, that close-up means that you hear his words with special attention. And of course, this is what sets in motion what I described earlier as one of the centers of the film, the film understood as a classic uh, romance of marriage. Um, she expects me to marry her. I don't want to. Stella says, that's normal. It's kind of sub voce, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting use. Jeffrey says, I'm not ready for marriage. Stella says, that's abnormal. And there you have Hitchcock following up the Peeping Tom theme, focusing on all these suggestions, you subtle suggestions you get around Jeffrey's own normality or abnormality, his sexual inhibitions, his potential impotence. What is it that's stopping him from uh, developing his relationship to uh, the beautiful Lisa? Then you go back to a, 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 well, it's actually, it's quite complicated. It's not quite a medium close-up. It's a medium, medium close-up. But again, it's a one shot. It's only got one person in the frame. And now it's Stella, which gives her words because of that visual uh, construction that gives her words a special emphasis. Every man is ready for marriage once the right girl comes along. And Lisa Fremont is the right man for any man with half a brain and who's got one eye open. And there you have the drama of vision suggested with the one eye open. And we'll follow this up in a moment. What is what is Jeffrey seeing? What is he not looking at? What fantasies involved? What's his relation to reality? All of these things are suggested in the sequence that we'll watch now. And I hope you'll see the use of the transcript in getting hold of uh, this important moment of action. People ought to do is get outside their own house and look in for a change. Yes, sir. How's that for a bit of homespun philosophy? Reader's Digest, April 1939. Well, I only quote from... Sorry, it's a little further on. a beautiful young girl and you're uh, 
reasonably healthy young man. She expects me to marry her. That's normal. I don't want to. What's that normal? Well, I just, I'm not ready for marriage. Every man's ready for marriage when the right girl comes along. And Lisa Fremont is the right girl for any man with half a brain who can get one eye open. Oh, she's all right. Did you do have a fight? No. Father loading up the shotgun? What? So, I think you'll see some of the, um, you know, the, the, the labor of academic film analysis when you have to kind of destroy your pleasure in watching something by taking a, a, a lot of notes, a lot of attention to what's going on. But actually, as my students eventually used to find, that transcript work, which is a terrible labor, does become a labor of love. And it really pays off in, in getting to really understand uh, what is happening in, in the films. Now, when I suggested these multiple dimensions of effect, of emotional investment that the spectator can bring to the film and the manipulation of those and the questions it raises and the openings for interpretation, I wanted to go back to what I mentioned previously, and the fantasy elements, the ways in which film is both very realistic, but is also full of fantasy. And this comes through in a beautiful and well-known sequence, the sequence of the first kiss uh, in Rear Window. So let's have a look at that now. Uh, the nurse leaves various and Lisa arrives uh, mm -hmm. night falls <laughs> So again, let me just emphasize that as you see, but interestingly, not through Jeffrey's eyes, you see the real without Jeffrey's subjective interpretation. It's very close to what he sees. Uh, you have the rich uh, sound of the moves of the music, the singing voice of children on the street, uh, cars going by, a, a sonorous a lot of sonorous elements devoted entirely to uh, giving three-dimensional depth to the impression of the real that cinema is so capable of generating. But now, as we move into watching Jeffries himself asleep, we'll see the ways in which cinema, while it can be hyper-realistic, that's not the only way it works, as Krakauer seemed to think. It's it's the ways in which it it's full of fantasy. And here, as I said earlier, Hitchcock's fantasy, the woman, the clothing of the woman, the filming of the woman. Just watch the speed of the kiss here. This is what I mean by the fantasy element. This is not realistic at all. Hitchcock has done something special with the filming here. Sorry, let's go back. So it's, yeah. 
does your leg? It hurts a little. And your stomach? Empty as a football. And your love life? I'm not too active. Anything else bothering you? Mm-hmm. Or you? And with that, who are you? You have the underlining of the fantasy element. Uh, a beautiful sequence. Um, what happens though is that Jeffries is, is 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 really quite mean to uh, to Lisa. Reading from top to bottom. But just let's see this. What I'm calling the the fantasy element as Lisa displays herself to Jeffrey's gaze, but also in a sense Hitchcock's gaze and our gaze. Lisa. Carol. Fremont. Is this the Lisa Fremont who never wears the same dress twice? Distractions. Already in Jeffries, is this the Lisa Fremont who never wears the same dress twice? It is a little mean and a little sarcastic as he is throughout his interactions with her. Uh, but let's see more of those interactions. Uh, 20 minutes. Here's their, you know, kind of troubled dialogue. Uh, part of a romance genre, the, the people um, are not, will not get along well, but in the end it all works out. But there's a real kind of savagery here. Then I had to dash to the Waldorf for a quick drink with Madame Dufresne. It was just over from Paris with some spy reports. And then I had to go to 21 and have lunch with the Harper's Bazaar people. And that's when I ordered dinner. Then I had two Paul showings 20 blocks apart. Then I had to have a cocktail with Leland and Slim Haywood for trying to get his new show. And then I had to dash back and change. Well, now tell me. Tell me. Now, what was Mrs. Hayward wearing? Now here, Jeffries simulates interest in what his romantic partner, partner is saying and how she spent her day, but it's only simulated. She doesn't at first realise that. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, a nasty thing to do. She looked wonderfully cool. Yeah. She had on the most divine Italian handprint. Oh, Italian. Italian. Oh, you. To think I planted three nice items in the columns about you today. You did. Well, you can't buy that kind of publicity. I know. Someday you may want to open up a studio of your own here. Well, uh, how would I run it from, say, uh, Pakistan? Jeff, isn't it time you came home? You could pick your assignment. Well, I wish there was one I wanted. Make the one you want. You mean leave the magazine? Yes. For what? For yourself and me. I could get you a dozen assignments tomorrow. Fashions, portraits. When I don't laugh, I could do it. Well, that's what I'm afraid of. Can you see me driving down to the fashion salon in a Jeep, wearing combat boots and a three-day beard? Wouldn't that make a hit? Well, I could see you looking very handsome and successful in a dark blue flannel suit. Now, uh, let's stop talking nonsense, shall we? Hmm? I guess I'd better start setting up for dinner. So there you see she's kind of rebuffed and hurt by Jeffrey's attitude. And what interests me here is that here is a moment of conflict between the romantic couple. And here, that conflict provides an engine for Jeffrey's interested spectatorship of what's going on outside. He turns to look outside to try and escape from his real cares and woes to entertain fantasies through what he's seeing. 
And maybe in this sense, he is like the spectator as Hitchcock imagined the cinema goer to be, someone who leaves behind the cares and woes of work and marriage for a moment's distraction in the cinema. Here, the world outside the room that Jeffrey observed becomes a kind of cinema to distract him from reality. And there's all kinds of ironies at work here. The song that Miss Lonely Hearts, the lonely woman that we're seeing now, uh, is listening to is a very romantic song. And she's led to imagine, because she's so lonely, that she has someone round for, for dinner and they're having a glass of wine together. And you'll see in a moment how Jeffrey's in his fantasy, enters her fantasy. She introduces the imaginary suitor into her apartment. It's very important here that you see Lisa in the background, in um, uh, not in focus because Jeffries is not at all focused on her. You can see from the intensity of his gaze and the, you know, the excellent acting he's doing to, to really project that fascination with what he's seeing across the courtyard. Then his rather guiltily looking round and you know as I say this is such a complex moment uh, in the sense that Jeffries if he's now a cinema spectator is watching Miss Lonely Hearts have an imaginary kiss and from that position of the interested spectator in a sense imagine he is having the kiss and for a moment, that brings him back to reality. After all, he's just been kissing his real girlfriend and he looks over his shoulder guiltily as, as if he might now be caught out before going back to the spectacle. To see you is to love you are the words of the song and given tremendous complexity here. And of course, Jeffries replies to her toast. He's so involved in the act of seeing. Not surprisingly, a film like Rear Window, because of these multiple layers and their interaction and their real complexity, has provoked many different kinds of, of, of response. In the late 70s and early 80s, Rear Window was essentially reinterpreted, taken up and reinterpreted by feminists who saw Jeffrey's gaze as typifying the male gaze 
objectifying the women uh, in the film and uh, with complex theories of uh, psychoanalysis underlying that around activity and passivity and many things. Slavoj Žižek, uh, following that view, adapting that view, takes a slightly different uh, approach and, and stresses something I emphasized uh, earlier uh, today. The hero's desire is to elude the sexual relation at any price, that is to get rid of the unfortunate Grace Kelly. What happens on this side of a window in the hero's apartment, the amorous misadventures of Stuart and Keller, is by no means a simple subplot, but on the contrary, its very centre of gravity. Uh, you know, a view which I really agree with, you know, only complicated a little by saying that actually there are two centres of gravity whirling around each other. Uh, others have, have stressed what I mentioned about we're all a nation of peeping toms now, that the film is uh, involved in its own cultural and political complex, and that has much to do with the government surveillance practices of the time and uh, the power of McCarthyism in uh, US culture in that period. I remember uh, when a friend of mine who is the son of the uh, great journalist of China, Edgar Snow, asked to see the files his father had on him when it became possible to do so that the FBI had on him and they had a room full of boxes and Chris uh, read through them and found things like they had people round to dinner. Some of them looked very suspicious. And, you know, so all that is very real. And um, again, it's quite interesting to go into textual and look at some of the writing that Hitchcock may well have read um, and that may have in some sense informed the questions of spectatorship, which are shown to be complex rather than simple, full of fantasy as much as reality. And to go back to uh, a couple of texts from Baudelaire's fantastic book of prose poems, Le Spleen de Paris, and notably La Foule, or Les Foules, and Les Fenêtres, Crowds and Windows. Here he notes, the spectator enjoys the incomparable privilege of being able to be himself or someone else as he chooses. Like those wandering souls who go looking for a body, he enters as he likes into each man's personality. A description, you might say, of the cinema to come, where the spectator can enjoy the incomparable privilege of entering so many different stories. Perhaps you will say, he says in another uh, prose poem, Windows, perhaps you will say, are you sure that the story is the real one? But what does it matter what reality is outside myself, so long as it has helped me to live, to feel that I am what I am? Is the story the real one? Story, realism and fantasy. It's that intermingling that Krakauer noticed, even though he tried rigorously to forget it, that really typifies Hitchcock's work, shows us why it has such multiple dimensions and why when you see these films again or when you see them for the first time 50 years later or almost 100 years later, they still retain the power to compel a fascinated reading on our parts. They are artistic objects which do survive across generations. Uh, let me stop there and open up for a few moments of any comments or questions or queries. And I'm just really hoping you were able to hear as well as to see the little sequences that we were able to show in this very short space of time. Thank you.
Adam, I see your enthusiastic hand raised once again. Uh, as always, John, thank you very, thank very you, much. Uh, yeah. I thought it was really, really great and fascinating, and the, the clips work beautifully. Thank you for sorting that out, everyone. Um, I was really fascinated by all this discussion of the psychoanalytical aspects of the film. Um, there are several things, one of which is that it's, set, it's filmed on a set. You know, it's a very, very elaborate set, so that this sense of fantasy is extremely apparent all the way through. I mean, you know, today, possibly, if you were making a film in Greenwich Village, you'd film it in Greenwich Village, but this is a yeah. very elaborate set, yeah. does all sorts of things. Similarly, I wonder whether what you're sort of suggesting or has been suggested by other critics is that it's, to use a cinematic term, it's a projection, so that what we're actually seeing <laughs> is a projection of... <laughs> his anxieties around marriage and sex and all the rest of it in yeah. the form of these possibilities that the single happy woman, the unhappy married couple, the happy married couple, you know, all these possibilities that he sees. And it's interesting that the actual salesman flat, salesman flat is the one directly opposite in the middle of yeah. his view. I wondered what you thought about those just observations, really. It's like a distorting mirror of his psyche yeah. i think it um i mean i think that's why i kind of teasingly presented that little reference to wittgenstein um in the sense that you can you know you can take the matter quite deeply and say something like what a film like rear window does and, you know, many other films blow up and, you know, very consciously do that same kind of thing. They ask you to, to question or to think about the very simple verb to see. You know, because to see seems, if you're a sighted person, to see seems a very unproblematic thing. It, it, it's something we take almost entirely for granted. And one of the things that Wittgenstein was doing and many other philosophers, Hegel and you know many, many others have done the same thing, is, is to say, well, nothing is simple. You know, there isn't just an external real which we unproblematically see. There are very complex questions of framing mirroring and the real truth is is we interpret what we see uh, in fact to see it's often said is perception interpreted you know we, we, we never really just get perception we always are already programming things and you know that really comes through in all the ways you suggested and referred to in that Jeffries is kind of drawn to seeing, perhaps, these different examples of the possibility of marriage, you know, boring marriage, murderous marriage, uh, early days of sexy marriage, unmarriage, you know, all sorts of different things, all the things which are kind of going on in his head, but maybe which he can't you know, he, he's having trouble articulating, but yet he sees them. You know, it, it's a very fascinating thing, particularly as we come to realise in the present moment that what people see and what they think they see in terms of election results or, or whatever, it, it, it's not, it's just not unproblematical. <laughs> 